Avaya, and with me today is Tim Kenyon. Hi. How are you? Uh, Tim's also an ENP with Conveyance Systems. We're going to be talking about Enterprise Next Generation 911 Solutions. So four years ago, I presented, I think in this very room actually, uh, what I called Next Gen 911 Over the Top, which was basically establishing that call as we do today, but then using an over the top method to get extra additional data to the PSAPs um, so you could, we could convey this information. Um, we were asked to present this to the FCC, which we did, and um, from there, Tim built the product. So I'll let you go ahead. So I guess we're talking a little bit about introductions for ourselves. Uh, I've been with, conveyance has been around since 1987, so we're going on almost 30 years of uh, being a development company, an engineering company, and developing technologies, getting information and making that information available to everybody. And I've been uh, fortunate enough to be with the company for 23 of those 30 years at this point. And uh, we're very proud of the accomplishments we've had. We were a Nortel developer partner for a long time. We are now an Avaya uh, developer partner along with quite a number of other vendors. And that includes our uh, PC-based attendant console applications, which were very dominant in healthcare and government um, op applications. And uh, now we have a, a more of a focus on our Century 911 applications and developing uh, enterprise 911 solutions, location discovery and notification in that enterprise world. So my role really at, at Avaya is to manage our communications and networking feature sets to make sure that we've got public safety built into the products and the designs from the get-go. Uh, I'm very active uh, from a legislative and regulatory perspective. I sit on the FCC Disability Advisory Committee. Uh, I sit on the APCO and NENA Standards Committees. And I also sit on uh, very important committees, extremely important committees, like the Task Force for Optimized PSAP Architectures. One of the most important committees <laughs> <laughs> Doing a lot of great work, so looking at these architectures, right? Um, and, and changing really what should be out there. So the reality of the over-the-top model is that it is not a replacement, of, or it is a replacement of the Alley database. Alley any data is going away. It's static data that was provisioned. Um, it might be okay as a reference point, but next gen 911 replaces that architecture. Next Gen 911 data is real time. It's uh, dynamic and it's updatable to whatever interested parties uh, need to get that data. And that's what we're really focusing on is taking the enterprise networks, which are going to be huge contributors of additional data into a Next Gen 911 environment. Whether it's beacon location information, like you heard about earlier, or it's actual data from the building, such as temperatures and thermostats. So the problem with 911 in 1968 was, what's the number for 911? You had seven digit local numbers for police, fire, and medical, a different number in every single town. And 911 created, was created to alleviate that problem, right? So again, based on basic routing protocols in the 70s. Phone numbers were unique, single appearances, and they were also um, fixed locations. That's where the phone company put them, and that's where the phone company left them. The phone company moved them, the phone company documented that. But unfortunately, IP brought us into this new realm. Right, so mo enterprise mobility uh, really changed the dynamics here for location. Um, people were now able to pick up their devices and they were able to move to another building. Uh, they were able to just move from floor to floor in a building and log into another extension, uh, which basically meant that really their phone number did not equal location anymore. And that's what a lot of this technology and previous technology was built on. So I could start over here at breakfast you know, and log into my desk in the morning and I'd be perfectly fine. But after lunch, I'm gonna move over to this other building and I've gotta to go to a change to another queue. I'm gonna be able to log into my phone and I'm gonna be able to carry my extension and all of its attributes with me in the enterprise environment. Problem is that I'm no longer here anymore. I'm over here. I'm in another building, I'm in another location, I'm across town. If I'm to pick up my phone at that point and dial 911, 
that phone number no longer is valuable as far as a location element for me. You know, we have to be able to identify the device that I'm on and where the device actually is, not necessarily my individual information or my personal phone number itself. You know, so it's a matter of being able to track the devices in those environments, not the phone number, and relying just on that basic information in that alley database. You know, we want to think about 911 as being who you are, but really it's, it's where you are, and we, and we lose track of that. So the, the problem changed over the years. With the full deployment of IP in the corporate networks, mobility became the problem. And that just wasn't an internal problem. It was a residential problem with the introduction of things like Vonage and Skype and everything else that lets you have communications wherever you were. Tracking that current location was always a challenge. And there were horror stories of uh, someone, with, uh, someone in the service who was stationed in Virginia but then was you know, moved to Asia Pacific a domestic dispute, the wife picked up the phone, no one changed anything, and the Virginia Police Department gets an emergency call from the Asia Pacific Theater. I'm not sure there's anything anybody can do with that. But, right, people expect this to work. So location discovery became the challenge. How do I find where the devices are? And I worked on some of the initial multi-line telephone system initiatives. And we were focused on where was that device on the network? Because that was the problem. And we could do layer two discovery. I could tell you what switch port it was, but really, I couldn't tell you where that switch port was cabled. And that, that's where that became a problem, right? Managing the wire map database. It, it, it is really kind of interesting. You know, when you, when you uh, describe this to, you know, our enterprise customers, and we know we can track H323 and SIP devices down to the data switch port level. If we can properly identify where that data switch port is cabled to, then we can certainly get down to that level of granularity that some people believe you need to have. The problem comes in when Joe Technician goes in that closet, now he takes a cable here and he moves it here, and it's not properly documented. And I use this all the time, and only a few people ever laugh at the joke, but this is where I'm a big supporter of tasers, stun guns, shock collars, anything that's keeping people out of your closets and jacking with your wiring app once you've established that. Because it is hard to manage. We have some very large clients where you have 30,000 phones in a very large environment. Somebody has to go through and try to audit that and manage that wire map, and it's almost going to be impossible for them to maintain a clean database out there. It can be done, and there are methods to do this, you know, based upon grouping ports or grouping data switches to identify a particular location but trying to keep it that pristine to be able to map every data port to every cubicle is almost impossible for a large organization to maintain properly. It's become so labor intensive that there was a company that developed a jack that had some intelligence in the jack. And by spending three or four dollars on the jack, sure, it was a sizable investment, but you could eliminate having to do cable records. Because now I had a trackable uh, endpoint that didn't move or wasn't easily moved. Um, now again, access points, things, there's always going to be problems. But these are, these are what people come up with. We find most customers actually do a layer three deployment where they look at subnet maps. Subnets are easy and free. I can break up my building into subnets. And this is one of the, the things that we introduced with the NINA model legislation 10 years ago when we talked about zones. Start with fire alarm zones, because there's always the argument. 10,000 square feet, 14,000 square feet, 25,000 square feet. I think Illinois is 22,500 22, square feet on a floor. Another state might have 14. You know what? The square footage is irrelevant. This is a very open building. I don't know, this is probably, I would guess maybe not, maybe a little more than 100,000 square feet. If you told me Herman Hall, I could probably find somebody in here in less than a minute. If this was an office building with rows of cubicles, you would never find somebody in a matter of a few minutes. So it came down to the building space and the use. You know, a very interesting thing happened here the other day when we got here and we were setting up. 
You walked in, and the fire alarm was going off in the building. Where did everybody migrate to? First place everybody goes to is the fire panel. You know, well, and you see that in every building. And I've been pointing this out to customers recently because some of the vendors that are out there are still trying to push, we need to know where that phone is right to the desktop level. But when you walk into any large facility these days, the first thing I'm looking for now is where's that fire panel and how's it broken out? This one here or the one in our hotel? Northeast zone, southwest zone, northeast, you know, fourth floor. And that's what the fire department is looking for. That is what those rescuers are looking for. Let's get them down to a respectable zone that they know they're going to be able to search. Because yeah. as, we, as we find out, trying to find you down at a cubicle level, you know, they're not going to know where that cube is. If you go down into the National Capital Region, I don't know if it's a fire code, the NCR, but you walk into almost any building, including the FCC, there is a fire panel like within 20 feet of that main entry door. And I got to imagine, because that's so consistent in commercial buildings, it's got to be part of the fire code. Or, or somebody's got a bug about that being that way, whether it's the building inspector or whatever. But I would imagine somewhere there's a code because every commercial building in the NCR, that's where that panel is. So what a great response point. If you have a 911 call, you can put a very inexpensive monitor. What are there, 10 floors in the commission building? Nine floors? Eh, whatever. It's a big building. It's a complex building. You're not getting anywhere past the first 20 feet. I've seen those guys, they're big, and they carry guns. I don't care if I know that I'm going to the eighth floor or the seventh floor. I don't even know where the cube numbers are, right? But they need to know that somebody dialed 911. They need to know that 911 is on the way to the building. And they need to know that local response is going to be required. So 2016, the new problem, in my opinion, it is data. Data that's internal and external public safety situational awareness. There was an alarm in this building that fire alarm panel is the situational awareness. If I'm working in my office building and I'm sitting in cube 2C231, the fire department, police department, ambulance needs to know 211 Mount Airy Road. There's one entrance to the building. If they get any closer to me, they've got a vehicle in my lobby creating another 911 event, right? <coughs> but if somebody knows that I'm having an emergency, if my internal people know where that is, if my internal people can look at the additional data, that solves the situational awareness. So that brings up what we talk about as the additional data repository. And this is a functional element that's part of the next generation 911 architecture. It's an element that sits at the edge or inside the enterprise network and talks into what's known as the ESINet. Right. So the, the, the idea here is to be able to gather as much information to be able to provide the situational awareness internally uh, to the people that are in that location, those internal first responders. We all want to know in the event of an emergency when we pick up a phone and dial 911 that I've got somebody who knows that I'm having an emerging event that needs a, to be addressed immediately. I want to be able to um, uh, address their need immediately because it's going to take public safety anywhere from four to 15 minutes to actually arrive at a location in some cases. Provide as much situational awareness as you possibly can to your internal first responders by gathering all the information that's in that enterprise environment. Let's pull in the cable map records so I know where these cables are terminated to. Let me pull in floor plans so that I can understand what the layout of the facility is. Let me pull in building information, system information, so I can see where the hot spots are in the building, which might give me a clue why somebody dialed 911 in the first place. Be able to gather all of this information and pull that into a central repository that I can now make available to all first responders, primarily the internal first responders initially, but making sure that information is now available so that we can provide that to the public safety uh, first responders as needed so that they can make their incident planning process a little more refined and cleaner when they're arriving on site, as an example. The most important thing is to understand a location. 
a dispatchable address. And one of the best moves I've seen in the industry over the last years was the focus on dispatchable address. 3241 South Federal, that's where we are. That's what's important. If I'm downstairs in the bog, or I'm over in the cafeteria, or I'm over here, people have minutes to deal with that if they're aware of a situation. But public safety is coming to 3241. You've got time to start polling the network, to start looking at events to determine where public safety needs to go. So we need to be able to route where the call needs to go to. We've got all the capabilities in the network to understand from a dispatchable address. I don't need external help to do that. There are plenty of utilities within the network that can show me that information. So if I've got wired phones or wireless phones or virtual offices, it doesn't matter. I can walk into California, into our office. My phone number is not, a re is not relevant, but the phone number assigned to the fourth floor visitor cube area will route to the Santa Clara police. They'll know they're coming to 4655 Great America Parkway. And most importantly, the security guard in the lobby knows exactly what cubicle I'm in, and, you know, and they know that public safety is going to be pulling up into the front of the building in a couple of minutes, right? So that solves that problem. The routing is easy. Uh, it's about the awareness, the dispatchable address, getting the internal information to public safety. It's the big data, floor plans, maps, video feeds. The problem that exists is we've got an archaic 911 network that basically is not capable of carrying data. Next Gen 911 will replace that network, but the PBX can't send location data to the 911 Peace app. We've, we're attached to this unintelligent network. So we've been trying to solve the wrong problem. We've been using Annie Alley databases that were built to establish addresses. And we take a 30 character field in that database and we put things like cube 2C231. Tom, where's cube 2C231 in my building? You don't know. Have a clue. Wild, wild guess, let's just say. Where's you've 2C231? You've never been there. Neither is the dispatcher. Yeah. Neither has the first responder. So spending money to get this information is kind of like saying, I'm wearing blue socks. Very detailed, but very irrelevant, right? So that's what we try to do. We step around that. What most people are afraid to admit is that we've fallen into this category of the way we do 911 and the way we've done it for years. And phone numbers are how 911's routed. It's the most irrelevant piece of information in 911 today. People will say, I need to call back the device. There's current language in the National Fire Prevention Authority's 1221 document that was put in there that says, I have to have a dialable phone number on every single telephone device, making my office of 1,500 phones to have 1,500 Annie Alley records at a dollar a month or 1,500 month over month OPEX. When I've got one front door, I've got security on staff with a monitor that knows exactly when and where that 911 call took place. I need one entry for that entire building. But you've got people that are in the business of selling these Annie Alley databases. And in many cases, they just don't want to, as much as they hate it, and they'll stay, oh, it's terrible, it's old technology, it's a, such a cash cow, it's a double-edged sword for, for really, you know, what they're doing. So this is why enterprise deployments fail, and we see this time and time again, right? You know, it's, it's the mass confusion, what's needed. There's not enough legislative regulatory advice. 
Look how hard we had to fight for Carrie's law. For those of you not familiar with Carrie's law, nine-year-old girl in a hotel, mom's getting stabbed in the bathroom, she dials 911, fast busy, four times. Why? Every police car, fire truck, or ambulance she's ever seen, her grandparents, her parents, her teachers, her dare officer, everybody said, in case of an emergency, do what? Dial 911. What did that hotel need? 9911. Carrie's law is about direct access to 911. Carrie's law is about on site notification for awareness and don't answer your own 911 calls unless you've been authorized by somebody because you're not an emergency medical dispatcher. That bill is flying through everywhere we bring it up, state by state. We made zero progress in 10 years with multi-line telephone system location determination technology. That was brilliant from an architectural perspective, but it didn't really solve the problem, and it was too complex, right? People didn't understand it, and they all had you know, costs and no plans associated with it. Deployments fail. We go into places when, when I brought Carrie's Law to Commissioner Pye, I said, look, my estimation, just by being a road warrior, I'll bet you 80% of the hotels are 911 compliant. Top 10 hotels did a survey. 55% of the corporates, not 911 compliant. Nearly 80% of the independent hotels, not 911 compliant. And those are the ones that told the truth. So, again, we presented four years ago this over the top, which basically has turned into Century, which is, is what we had Tim develop. A lot of people say, why didn't Avaya build this? I don't build DHCP servers. 911 triggers our phone calls. But, as you'll see, the culmination of the data does not belong in the phone system. There were some pending events that you know came about. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been with Conveyant for over 23 years, and the company itself has been around for nearly 30. And we were in the attendant console business for all these years, uh, providing solutions for our government facilities, healthcare, higher ed, you know, for answering physicians, those telephone switchboard applications. And I was continually running into um, situations where uh, some of our larger federal government clients were looking for a better 911 solution. We now have SIP, we have uh, IP phones, we have mobility, we need to be able to find where these devices are. And I was looking at the legacy vendors that had been doing this for such some time, not offering what I thought was the right solution. Now, I'm, I'm a sales guy. I was an engineer years ago, but I've moved into sales over the past 20 years. And I just saw something a little bit different that's like, there's got to be an easier way to do this. I approached Mark at that point in time, this is probably 2008, eight nine. at that point, and I said, I might be looking to get into this 911 business a little bit because I think we can have and develop a better solution in order to be able to help these people and help these customers do their location discovery and provide that level of situational awareness that was severely lacking in this industry without costing an arm and a leg and charging so much money. And that's where the Sentry application came about. The development of providing this data over the top of the legacy 911 network and being able to push this information into the public safety answering points was something that came about based upon this conference and the conversations we had over the time and uh, working with our customers. So we developed the Sentry solution uh, to be able to do the location discovery, uh, to not interfere with a call, to stay out of the call path. And we don't want it to be a roadblock to getting the 911, but we wanted it to be a proactive solution that was able to go out there, find the devices, be able to report the devices properly to the right people, tell the PBX where the device is so that it can outpulse the proper 10-digit caller ID or Annie or ELIN, if you will, in order to make sure that that information is presented properly to the public safety answering points. And it was about building it in a modular fashion so that the customers were not getting charged for things that they don't need, but making sure that it was um, enhancing the capability that they've already invested in in their telephone switch environment and you know, making it affordable in that sense. Not getting in the path of the call is huge. There are applications that are out there that vendors will say, well, forget all that stuff that you invested millions of dollars in your very large PBX system to do. We want you to push it over to our little box over here, you know, with this uh, little PBX that we built, and we're going to do digit manipulation and to send the call out. But it's introducing a call, a point of failure in the call path that is unnecessary. 
It's irrelevant, it's unnecessary, it's just causing a problem, and it's making this, uh, the solution much more expensive than what it really needed to be. Build an application, make it virtualized, make it so that people are not investing in proprietary hardware or appliances, and then help them solve the problem. Yeah. Gather the information in that enterprise environment, make it available to the internal folks, make that available over the top, and eventually be able to push this through next gen to the public safety answering points directly, you know, and make it an affordable solution for everybody. So we've heard a lot today, um, the guys here at IIT, and we had a great discussion at lunch about indoor location technology, really cool stuff. And Carol was telling me, oh, you've got to see this stuff, it's great. And it's fantastic, wonderful technology. But my first question for Barat was, how are you going to get that data to the PSAP? Because I'm stuck with this analog, effectively a POTS line. How do I get the data to the people that need it? And this is where I explain to them the over-the-top model. And again, this is how we produce this data today. So Kerry's Law, direct access, alerting, no interception. Great. We solved the problem there. Get the 911 call to go. How do we get the data that we're going to capture? We're going to bring all this data into our, our ADR box, whatever data we've got on the building but the problem still exists, how do I get this data to the PSAP? We said before the internal first responders are the critical people that need to be alerted of the additional data. So we take all this information, whatever we have, the alert, video feeds, temperatures, floor plans, material safety data sheets, whatever. I don't care what you've got. Excel spreadsheets, you name it. We give all of this information and we create a web instance internally for the internal first responders to look at all of the collected data. And here's the magic. We take all of this data and then dynamically we publish this out into a DMZ. What's there is what I want to be there. Who can get to it is whoever I say can get to it. I don't care what you deploy from a security bottle. Username, login, TCP IP port and IP address filtering, whatever. Put whatever security on it that you want. Public safety can now come to me and get that data live as it's happening. But in addition, first responders can also get to that data if I allow it. And I literally could have a firefighter walk through the door with a tablet in his hand. And it wouldn't be a far stretch to develop the application that starts to talk to the access points and look at the beacons in here to get directional information. Look at information such as the floor plan or uh, heat maps of the building. This is marketing stuff that shouldn't have been in there. But this is, this is how we're dealing with the solution today. We're changing the game. It's not about the Annie Alley database. That's a hard pill for a lot of carriers to swallow. And you can see it in the news. New York State, over the past four years, five years, 1.4 billion dollars collected in 911 fees, 1.4 billion. Of that money, 14% went to 911, 14%. Sitting on the, the, the task force at the FCC, we looked at funding diversions. Some states, it was clear in the legislation if there's money in the next gen budget and you need it to balance the budget, you're allowed to take it. Nobody violated any laws. Nobody did anything outside of what they were not allowed to do. Why do we have laws on the books that allow that? So when people say, how are we going to fund this? I say, well, the first thing we're going to do is close, lock the door, use the money for ourselves and then figure out what we can and can't build. So I know we're running a little behind today, 
So we'll leave uh, last couple minutes for any Q&A. Yes. Mark, for the, the ACR, is, uh, is it also using like the neatest and the standard in uh, I3 rules where I think you could add additional call data records to it as well? So it would use like that XML interface or um, could it publish it both ways? Because it's kind of over the top portal as well as the formal in I3. That's a great point, Jay. Thanks for bringing that up. So the, so the way that we propose to do this Next generation 911, this is a point where a lot of people get confused. Next gen 911 is not about pushing multimedia to the Peace app. It's about pushing a session to the Peace app, and it's about advising the Peace app through an EIDD document or whatever that there is additional data available. Here are the URIs and URLs that are relevant to that data. If I'm on the side of the road changing my tire in an unsafe manner, the Peace app does not need 20 videos of me doing that, nor do I want that because of YouTube. <laughs> but if somebody wanted to look, hey, I've got 20 calls that have data, oh, let's look at one and decide if we need more. So it's, it, yeah, this model doesn't change. My URL, my repository, stays the same. Today I'm going to convey it in a static alley record. Hey, there's a 911 call at Avaya. Go to e911.avaya, baskingridge.avaya.com. Here's the URL for the ADR in that building. If there's five emergencies going on, you get all the data. That's it, simple. Where, where some of the traditional vendors have used that additional data field in order to be able to provide that cubicle 2C231 information, being able to provide a bit.ly, a small link or something like that to get back into the DMZ to be able to get to that data that we're talking about now will provide that concept of next gen 911 type data over the top of the legacy environment today. You know, with next generation 911 coming into play and creating and putting those links in the PitaFlow objects itself that are being delivered to the Peace app, we've accomplished the same thing without having to change anything in that customer's environment. Or even at the Peace app, because it's a web session. Right. Yes? Microphone. Thanks. I, I, an application example of just what you uh, talked about. I was in the San Bernardino Peace app two weeks ago, and that was the Peace app that responded to the shooting last December. Um, since that shooting, they have entered into an agreement, the formal uh, memorandum with the Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber of Commerce member for the San Bernardino area for the uh, uh, San Bernardino, uh, so that if your retail company uh, has uh, surveillance cameras uh, that IP video, <coughs> they have agreed to make that the presence of that surveillance camera uh, known in the Peace app. Right. Now, when they get a 911 call, They will also see where there are video resources available that they can click on and uh, uh, look at a live stream of what's actually going on. A dispatcher that follows me at a, at a Yonkers. I'll get right with you, Bill. He mentioned to me on Twitter the other day, we were talking about web access in the Peace app. He said, I've got no less than four web browsers up at any given point in time where I am doing all this research. All we're doing is automating it and pointing it to where we know good data is. Yeah, Bill. Hey, you're on. Hey, I mean, you kind of stole my thunder a little bit, but that was I'm the sorry. point. No, no, it's, it's good. It's a good point. Um, and I think what's important to point out is that, you know, Tim and you had both just said, this is a way to do some of the new things without a lot of change at the PSAP. The one thing that you didn't mention, which was implied, and you kind of implied it, and Admiral Simpson kind of implied it a little bit, the one thing that you do need to be able to do some of this new over-the-top stuff is an IP connection into the PSAP, right? Yes. And so, and, and I think anyone in this room that's done the work or worked with the segment knows that you do have PSAPs like the one that you just talked about, but for every one of those, there's another one or another one or two where they have this aversion where there's a, it's, it's locked out. People may have it on an admin desk. It's not on the PSAP floor. 
Um, and until we IP enable the communications in and out of the PSAPs, none of the new stuff is possible, right? So the, the sine qua non of all of this is, is this move to IP connectivity. So long as you have that analog connection that you guys talked about ad nauseum at the beginning of the presentation, you really can't do anything new with it. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, as the Admiral will tell you, because he's, he's a secure, he's a crypto guy. Don't do it. <laughs> you're not going to secure it. Don't, don't, don't do, do it. it. You're not going to secure it. You need to do it. And you need to figure out how you're going to secure it. There you, right. go. there you go. That's the message. Exactly. Yes. Whenever we, whenever we go around. Yeah, no, that that's that's quite a right. Um, yes. Uh, maybe another comment on maybe another comment on that. Maybe another comment. Another comment <laughs> on uh, the ability for uh, PCAPs to open the website or open that browser session with the buyout. We've got a lot of uh, questions and answers and focus groups on how to open PCAPs, and uh, basically everybody has told me that they would not open the web page from an unknown source. Absolutely. You, you know, I mean, I, I got an email the other day. Um, Dear sir, you know, we have an invoice that needs to be paid that needs your attention right away. Can you please inspect this to make sure the quantity is right and forward, you know, to your billing department? And it was a Doc X. I'm like, yeah, like I'm going to open that, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know, sure, there's going to be, you got to be careful with all that. But again, if you're going to do it, encrypt it. And you got to do it. So, Always going to do that in an area where it fails. It, it fails in a, in a part of the network. I can contain that failure, spot it, follow up on it, uh, but still be able to take home. Yeah, we, so we actually we actually demonstrated this um, almost three years ago, I guess, when we started talking about delivering this type of information to the public safety answering points. We did this over secure networks, and we worked with uh, Rave Mobile Safety at that time to develop an open API into my application where we could list the phone numbers, the ELINs that were going to be presented to the local PSAP, you know, with Rave Mobile Safety, who had their software already resident in the public safety answering point. So it was already vetted. And by doing so, when that call came into the public safety answering point, that ELIN was presented to the CAD system. It was identified that this was a Rave Mobile Safety listed phone number that somebody's already vetted. And they were able to then, over a secure data network, get right into my server to be able to pull this relevant data about that particular 911 call. So it was in an encrypted safe environment that had already been vetted by the public safety answering point, and they were able to pull that data and protected it from that internal solution there. Now they had control of it in the PSAP. Now they've got it. And once they had it in control of the PSAP, then they had the option of then pushing that data out to the mobile data terminals. And so this is one of the things that I talk about when I'm presenting to my enterprise customers, is if I can get it from here to here, and we can get it there securely, now we can do so many more powerful things there. How would I love as a firefighter, and I come from a family of cops and firefighters, he was a cop at one point, this is what we do. You know, by being able to push this relevant information into these mobile data terminals, we're able to speed up the incident response and have them help plan their incident response on the fly instead of waiting until they get there and trying to evaluate the situation then. So in the respect of time for the other sessions, um, if, if we're, I'm here all day, so if you want to talk about this, 
happy to talk about this. There's a lot of ideas. That's what this conference spurs. I mean, the, the whole century over-the-top model was spurred by this conference, and it's a deployed solution today. And it's, it's kind of a radical change. Some, a lot of people don't like it because it's cannibalizing a revenue stream. I'm not here to capture revenue streams. I'm here to solve a problem. So, you know, but we do need to figure out a way to do this in a more open source environment because RAVE is not the answer of a secured point-to-point -point network is not affordable, it's not sustainable. Great for proof of concept mm -hmm. that the data can be gotten from point A to point B. Now I need the smart crypto guys, Admiral Simpson, <laughs> to figure out how we do this in an open deployable model where everybody's happy and protected. So when there's a bank alarm, I click the link. Oh, that is Mark Fletcher with the ski mask in the lobby of the bank. Again. Again. Yeah. <laughs> so, thanks very much. I appreciate you guys uh, hanging out with us.